problem is that the speaker has a name that. Um, <laughs> 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 oh, please, <laughs> go ahead. Hello everyone, so my name is Lefteris. I am uh, a postdoc at EPFL and uh, I'll be presenting a protocol for uh, fully asynchronous dis distributed key generation. This is work that I did this summer uh, at uh, VMware working with Dahlia and uh, Sasa. So <laughs> although we already had a talk yesterday about how awesome distributed key generation is and why we need it, we have kind of a different motivation which comes <laughs> from uh, the latest uh, gossip on uh, partial synchronous and fully asynchronous uh, consensus protocols. So if we look in uh, all the papers published in uh, the last couple of years, we get protocols that are very efficient. For example, there is SBFT, which uh, is, a is a partial synchronous uh, uh, consensus protocol that is linear in the common case and uh, only quadratic when you do a few chains. Then we get hot stuff, which is uh, a different uh, trade-off to SBFT, which is always linear. It pays a bit more latency in the common case, but it scales very well. And there is also VABA, which is a, a fully asynchronous uh, consensus protocol, which is inspired by hot stuff, and it can actually achieve the theoretically optimal uh, quadratic uh, communication complexity. <coughs> All these problems have uh, a trusted set of assumptions, which means that there needs to be a dealer at the beginning of the protocol who is going to disperse some cryptographic material to everyone else in order for those protocols to be efficient and actually for VABA to even work. Which means that if your trusted assumption breaks, if that dealer gives uh, the cryptographic material to the adversary, then the protocol is completely broken. So what we did in uh, this work is we actually removed this trusted setup and instead put a distributed bootstrap set that uh, can generate this cryptographic material in a decentralized way. So I know that everyone knows secret sharing, so it works on polynomials. I'm not going to discuss much about how it works. There is some secret sharing, which is the first one that uh, uh, was, uh, was uh, this is the first secret sharing protocol, and it needs an honest dealer. Then we have verifiable secret sharing, where the idea is that we use cryptographic commitments on the polynomial in order to, for the parties to verify that they are on the consistent polynomial and they don't get random shares. And then there is asynchronous verifiable secret sharing, which uh, is built to actually work in a fully asynchronous network. And there the idea is that we secret share the secret shares so that parties that were slow can come later and collect their shares from the rest of the network. And what can we do with uh, these uh, secret sharing protocols and what is useful in consensus? First, we can do threshold signatures, which means that we can generate signatures from the whole group of the consensus uh, collectively, which are constant in size. So this is why the protocol scales. And also, if the signature scheme that we use it does unique signatures, just like we saw in the previous talk, we can use that to produce randomness. So why uh, we use these protocols in uh, consensus? The idea is if you look into a classical bibliothetic protocol, uh, we have a leader, the leader asks everyone, prepare, commit, and the idea is that when it's someone asks you to commit, for example, the parties will send a signature, yes, I commit, here is a, a signature that I did what I said. The leader will collect all those signatures, put them together, and then broadcast it back to convince everyone that everything happened correctly, and that message is linear in size. As a result, linear size message to a linear number of, protocol, uh, of parties, we have quadratic complexity. So what SBFT and Hostat do is, in the same kind of protocol, the parties use their secret share in order to sign their uh, commitments, for example, and the leader is going to combine all those uh, secret shares in a constant size <coughs> signature, which is then sent back. As a result, this works in a, the linear case. As I said, if the dealer was malicious, then here the safety is broken because he knows the actual threshold key. As a result, he can sign whatever he wants with the threshold key and convince everyone that something happened that actually did not. In asynchrony, we use it for the same thing, for compaction as before. So if the delay is malicious, safety is broken again. And we also use it to recommend FLP because uh, it's used uh, in order to produce some randomness in the system, some uh, strong common coin, as we say it, which basically defends against uh, the adversary reordering the messages. So even if we don't want it for scalability in the asynchrony, we actually also need it for liveness. As a result, we are, it's very important in the asynchronous case. So 
Of course, every time someone says you have a trusted party and we don't want a trusted party, the idea is let's decentralize the protocol. Let's make everyone do it. And this is the idea of distributed key generation protocols. Every party is going to secret share some random value, some uh, private public key that they generate, and they're going to send their secret shares to everyone else. Party two will do the same, party three the same, party four the same. Then we add them up together, and we say that the addition is the collected key. So as long as one of those parties did their job correctly, everything's perfectly random. And that can work in a synchronous environment, but in the asynchronous case, we might have a malicious party that might not reply. So then we go to the, we can't wait for all of the parties to reply and then decide which are the malicious. We have wait for n minus f. But which n minus f party, right? We're in a synchronous case, so the adversary might actually be replying to us and slowing down some other nodes. So it seems that we kind of need consensus. We need to decide on which parties actually did their job correctly in order to bootstrap consensus. How we solve that? Well, in literature, there is a protocol called Hybrid TKG and I guess also the Protect protocol that basically employ a partial synchronous consensus in order to bootstrap uh, this decision process. The problem is that they can only have a threshold of f plus one, which is not enough for uh, VAB and hot stuff. And also there's a quick synchrony assumption. As a result, if you want it for a full asynchronous protocol, then you need either an initial bootstrap assumptions of some synchrony or it doesn't work. So, uh, I don't understand that. Yeah. Weak, synchrony? weak synchrony? Well, PBFT works. Weak PBF, in order for PBFT to reach consensus, in order for PBFT protocols to reach consensus, there needs to be a point in time at which all messages are guaranteed to be delivered within some unknown bound delta. It's called synchrony. Okay. It's, uh, it's, it's an unknown partial synchrony, maybe. It's, it's unknown, that's why we... The system, the, the system will change. The behavior of the adversary or something will change. That's yes, the, the adversary is constrained. But it's not a strong synchronous assumption, meaning that there is not a known delta bound. In strong synchrony, we know what the delta is. We design the protocol assuming that that delta holds. I continue. So in order to solve the first problem, we have to look into <laughs> what we get from the trusted setup and what we need for consensus. So in the trusted setup, if we secret share a threshold key that has a threshold of 2f plus 1, that means that our key is safe even if 2f of the parties are malicious. We cannot reconstruct the key even if 2f parties are malicious. However, the key is live only if at most f parties are malicious because if you have f plus 1 parts are malicious, you cannot collect enough shares. However, in consensus, we don't really need that. What we need is our say, key to be safe as long as at most f parts are malicious. If f plus one parts are malicious, consensus in the asynchronous is broken already, so we don't care about having a higher threshold. And as before, the key has to be live in uh, the same case. So the threat models do not match. And this is what we actually take advantage of in order to increase the threshold. So the idea is that we're going to separate the safety from the liveness thresholds of the protocol so that they match the quorums that uh, consensus needs. So the key will be safe uh, only if you have at most f parties uh, malicious and it will be live as long as 2f plus 1 honest parties participate, just like in consensus. How do we do it? Basically, we're going to use a, a two-dimensional secret sharing. So this is usually done with a bivariate polynomial, but we're not going to use a symmetric bivariate polynomial, we're going to use an asymmetric bivariate polynomial. In the first dimension, we put a high threshold, the 2f plus 1 threshold. So if there is secret S, we're going to create four secret shares, and you need three out of four in order to collect, in order to reconstruct the secret. Then on the y-axis, we're basically going to secret share each secret share with a lower threshold. So in order for S1 to be reconstructed, you need any two out of four of this uh, y11, y12, etc. And then we're going to run a an AVSS very similar to what exists in prior work. So let's walk a bit through it. What happens is that the dealer is going to generate uh, this uh, bivariate polynomial, and then he is going to send a row and a column at this party. So party one will get the first row and the first column, party two will get the second row and the second column, etc. And in this case, we have party one and party two that are honest, party three is malicious but participating, and party four here is slow, it's not getting anything during the dealing phase. 
So we have the dealing phase. The dealer is going to send the rows and the columns. The parts are going to cross-check that everything is fine. They're going to participate correctly. All three are honest for the dealing phase. So the result is that S1 and S2 have the whole row and columns. S3 has them, but is not going to participate later on. So if we go now and try to reconstruct the secret, we can't, right? We have S1, we have S2, S3 is not replying, S4 doesn't know anything. So in order to resolve that, what happens is that when S4 eventually comes alive, it can go and ask uh, part one and part two for these cells. And because they've sent the, they have the whole row, they can send it back to it. And since we, have, we only need two out of four in this dimension, it can reconstruct the secret cell four, and then we have three out of four, and we can reconstruct the full secret. So what are the guarantees that we get from this uh, AVSS? First, it's liveness, meaning that if the dealer is honest throughout the protocol, then everyone is going to have correct secret shares. And agreement, which means that even if the dealer is malicious, but there is an honest party that uh, decided at some point that the secret share is done correctly, then every honest party will also collect correct secret shares eventually. And actually, this is good enough to bootstrap hot stuff. We can just plug it into hybrid DKG, and the rest is the same. So I think if the previous properties are just the same for any ABS, right, on the previous slide here. So, so the, properties are the, next ah, the properties are the same, yes. The properties are the same. There is nothing new, just where we push the threshold higher. So now you can have a secret sharing scheme that needs two F plus one secrets to shares to reconstruct the secret. The, the, the properties are exactly the same. It's just we need to actually modify this proof in order to work again with the higher threshold. But the properties are exactly the same. Okay, so that's how we can bootstrap a partial synchronous protocol uh, in order to be efficient. However, of course, we wanted to solve the biggest challenge, and I'm trying to, I will try to explain some parts, but it's fairly complicated. It has like five layers. I explained this one. And uh, I'm actually going to explain the two that I think are the most interesting, which is the weak distributed key generation and the eventual partial common coin. The rest you can probably also figure out on your own if you see what works here. So in weak distributed key generation, just like any distributed key generation, we have the parties. Every part is going to secret share uh, a value using our HAVSS scheme. And what, uh, it's weak, first of all, because it has no termination guarantee. Like we cannot say that the DKG succeeds at any point in time. It will eventually succeed if we wait forever but we don't really know when that happens. That's why we call it weak. So how does it work? Every part secret shares, and then they collect uh, secret shares from everyone else. And basically, when they see uh, at least two F plus one of the parties did their job correctly, they are going to just broadcast a vector saying, here, these uh, two F plus one parties did their job correctly. That's my belief. If they see more parties finishing, they can broadcast a bigger vector. So they might actually broadcast any, a linear number of vectors where they claim that these parties are correct dealers. When they collect uh, uh, the same kind of vectors, so the, when they collect two F plus one matching vectors of a certain broadcast, they can output a prediction of the key. So P1 had broadcast P1, P2, P3. It got from P3 and P2 the same thing, two F plus one, we're fine. So it uh, says, I predict that Q1 is P1, P2, and P3. And I'm going to think that this is the distributed key for now. If uh, there is a later on a higher vector, then we can go in, we're going to output a bigger key. So the actual uh, thing that happens is that in order to output a bigger key, it has to be a, a new key. It has to be bigger than the previous one. So the predictions only increase in size. As a result, you're going to have at most F predictions from 2F plus 1 uh, dealers up to 3F plus 1 dealers. So why does this work? Well, if I made this prediction, that means that I saw those parties dealing correctly. So from the agreement property of HEFSS, I know that if I wait forever, eventually, everyone will see those parties terminating correctly. And as a result, everyone will make the same prediction. It's just that I'm not sure if my current prediction is the final prediction or there will be a bigger key later on. So this is what we call eventual agreement, which means that there exists some key, the ultimate key, that every honest party will eventually output. 
and never, ooh, magic, <laughs> and never change their opinion. We don't know that we have the ultimate key. We just know that eventually it will exist. And the second key property of WDKG is that if you have outputted a key K, and then later on we output a key J, then the bigger key will contain the previous one. So the predictions only increase in size. Okay, so that's how weak DKG works. And this basically feeds the eventual perfect common coin, which is basically a threshold signature protocol. Uh, and notice that in order for that to work, we need to have a blocking call on the agreement protocol, which means that if a party is going to invoke give me a common coin for the sequence number SQ, then it's not going to invoke SQ plus one until, the, until that returns, which is basically anyway what a, com a, a binary agreement uses when it does common coins. And how the eventual based common coin works, it's even simpler than WDKG. You get a prediction. If you get a better and you sign the sequence number, if you haven't terminated and you get a better prediction, you sign that too. You wait to collect match predictions and you generate the random number value. So why does this work? Let's see the properties. First of all, the termination is pretty simple. Eventually, we're going to have this ultimate key. Where why do you need randomness here? You need randomness for uh, the binary agreement. We're in full asynchrony, so only randomized protocols. Why did you choose the fully asynchronous one? We solved it before for the partial synchronous, so now we're solving also for the fully asynchronous. Ah, okay, so you're bragging about it. Cool, cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the termination comes from the eventual agreement of the WDKG. Eventually, there's going to be this ultimate key. So eventually, every part is going to use that key to sign the sequence number. So eventually, there's going to be randomness that is consistent with everyone. The predictability comes simply from the VSS. You only reveal your secret only after you are asked for it, and there is not enough malicious parties. And the final key property is the eventual agreement of the common coin, which says that there's going to be at most f, f sequence numbers for which two invocations of the common coin will disagree. So it means that there can be a sequence number SQ where I see randomness number 3, 2, and someone else sees a random number 5, 6. But this is going to be only a finite uh, amount of times, actually F in our protocol. And why does this work? To see how it works, let's see how the attack works, so how we get a disagreement. So we have party 1 and party 2, and their WTKG is telling them that they're in key 1. Party 4 is already on key 2. That's a mistake, a typo. And party three is malicious. Key one is smaller uh, than key two, which means that if a party has seen key two, it will never go back to key one. Okay, so how does the attack work? Uh, everyone invokes uh, EPCC with the sequence number. The party three is going to collect the uh, signatures from P1 and P2. It will generate locally a signature and have the random number from key one. Then it's going to let P2 deliver uh, the new key, key two. And because the new key is bigger, P2 will happily deliver the key and uh, re-participate for the same sequence number. So it's going to also sign SQ with the new key, and P4 anyway didn't uh, do anything before, so it can easily sign the same sequence number with the new key. So we have a new random value. So now the adversary has two random values. It can randomly deliver it to whoever he wants, and that's disagreement, basically. Parties do not agree on the common coin now. So that's bad. But the good thing is that if this happens, then this key is basically dead. So let's go to sequence number SQ plus one. P3 is going to try to do the same attack. So it's going to ask P1 to collect, uh, to sign SQ plus one. It's going to sign locally SQ plus one, but there is no other party that can help him get this random value. So basically key one is dead. So we lost one key. And we have only a finite number of keys, as I said. There is from size two F plus one to size three F plus one. As a result, there is only f times this attack can happen. So all we need to do is withstand this f times of attacks, and everything will be beautiful afterwards. So yeah, as I said, key cannot be used uh, again for the next invocation at most the points of disagreement. And once you have that, then there's nothing much more to do. You can plug in this common coin to any kind of asynchronous binary agreement you want. You can put it into Braha if you want which is n cubed. We put it into Mustafaoui's protocol because it's n squared. And it basically gives us a strong common coin minus this f times of disagreement. 
binary agreement because of weak validity can actually withstand this kind of uh, disagreements for a few times. So our binary agreement is basically, we'll take n to the fourth uh, communication uh, words or communication steps in uh, the bad case when uh, the adversary is mounting this attack <laughs> f times and n rounds, but for every other invocation. So if you invoke it a polynomial number of times, it's going to be optimal minus the f tries. Once we have, uh, once we have this binary agreement, we're basically going to run n parallel binary agreements. Each one basically asking the question to everyone, is this guy uh, dealing his secret correctly? Did this guy correctly de dealt his secret? And we basically wait for this n binary agreements to terminate. If something ended with one, then we put it in the key. If it terminated with zero, then we don't put it in the key. And when all n terminate, we have agreement. And we can plug that into, uh, generate a strong common coin for VABA, and then start running VABA uh, with the optimal communication complexity. If we run 10 squared, you actually amortize it to optimal. So that's it. But I just want to talk about what else we can do with uh, such a consensus primitive. One thing that we can do is actually create. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so before I ask the question, I have to say that Lefteris came to learn how to do theory from us. He ended up uh, teaching us how to do theory. So hence, um, uh, I'll ask a stupid question. Um, so when you plug this result, no, um, yeah, this slide is great. When you plug this result in a protocol like Hot Stuff, which has uh, linear communication complexity. Yeah. Then uh, yeah, you take all the setup and you get a linear. You know, you, you don't uh, violate the linearity. But when you plug it with in a protocol like Vava, um, couldn't you use secret recovery, which has um, um, quadratic communication complexity every time, and use existing you know f plus one secret? <coughs> uh, I'm not sure. I understand. So every time you want to use uh, the key, yeah. you actually do a key recovery. Key recover. Uh, what do you mean by key recovery? Okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> I have another question, right? Yeah. So, so you basically built up a custom agreement component. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so basically we built an agreement. Uh, Part of the protocol. Yes. But a, a, a slightly more straightforward approach would be to use non threshold based collective keys. The, it, they wouldn't work in full asynchrony. It's not about threshold keys. In full asynchrony, you need a way to generate randomness. OK, but I'm not worried about full asynchrony. Okay. No, in, in partial synchrony. Partial synchrony, you run your hot stuff with. Yeah, but this would be n squared. You don't need that. This will be n squared. And, but the, no, the question is, can you then bootstrap from that protocol with no threshold keys, and on top of that, do the uh, distributed key generation. So in order to generate, so you need to generate a 2f plus 1 key there. So that is where we pay the end for, to the fourth. It, it's the AVSS. It's not the consensus. So yes, but you wouldn't win much. You also mentioned a uh, uh, assumption that you assume threshold signatures. Yes, so you assume that there exists pairing based the crypto. Signatures. What do you mean I assume, where did I assume threshold signatures? You mentioned somewhere that here you will do a particular step with threshold signatures. No, you only do threshold signatures at the eventual perfect common coin. So you've done the secret sharing, you have That's secrets. Weak, right? That is? That's weak. Yes, yes, exactly. And when it's weak, it's when uh, you get the disagreement points. But when, it's, when you have consistency, that's how I call it, when every party has in the same set of dealers, that's when the coin is strong. So that's so. So, so by that time, you already have agreed on your key set. So you basically optimistically hope that you agree, and then there are times that you do agree, which is when you will actually generate correct threshold signatures, and times that you don't agree, which basically you will just wait a bit more for delivery. And then you move on to the next sequence number. For yes. It. Yes. I wanted to mention that another way to understand it could be that you present a table like this that starts with Canetti Raisin about 30 years ago, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, 
and then you have the increments, the, the improvements on the communication app complexity and the round complexity or message complexities because this is computationally secure now. Whereas those. Yeah, yeah. So th this is a comp this is only in a random oracle model. Like in, in information theoretic. The line of work starts from information theoretic. Yeah, yeah. And the the I think the state of the art there is n to the sixth. I think. I'm not sure. I, I think it was two years ago at Fort C. <laughs> so I guess one more thing in that is because uh, like Christian's paper from the CCS where they use any agreement on a subset kind of a pro protocol that could be employed on their weak DKG to get the similar thing. But maybe your new protocol has really small constant for randomized. So we can we can take weak DKG mm -hmm. and agreement on a subset so that given n keys we agree on a subset of those n keys yeah. yes sure sure we can use any binary agreement that doesn't do threshold signature but that would be i think n fifth log n basically it wouldn't be because the best case is kaneti rabin with christian's avss which end to the fourth and if you run and they don't share randomness like in my case in the weak dkg in the adkg basically the we all share the same common coin in the Kaneti wrapping protocol, you need to generate fresh randomness for every agreement protocol. So if you run n parallel of those, it goes into the fifth, and the log n comes from the exponential number of uh, terminations. So this would work, where it would be n fifth log n, and it wouldn't amortize. But we can take it offline, so that I can do it on a whiteboard. <laughs> Yeah, so cool stuff that we can do. One is we can do actually asynchronous payment channels, which means that they are payment channels that are secure under congestion, they're secure under censorship. They can even be secure under temporary forks, not long forks, but if you fork a couple of blocks, it's still good enough. And also we can use it to do confidential data exchange over the blockchain. Uh, that's fair, it's accountable, and it's dynamic. And like I have citations, I guess that would be online if you want to check this work out. Yes. What do you mean about uh, by, by uh, the channel is secure under congestion? Uh, so if you know how payment channels work, you have this delta time that the dispute transaction has to show up. If your uh, blockchain is congested, it might not show up because yes. there are other transactions and it's insecure. This protocol is secure even in that case, under congestion. You can, it can take arbitrarily long to uh, put the final, the closing transaction on chain. I can explain more of that. Uh, there's also the paper. We can take it offline, however you want. OK. OK, yeah, so I'm mean, way done. So any more questions are welcome. Thank you. OK, so I'll mind the next block.